Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, Let the Girls Live, a reading from the book of Christian scripture in the First Testament, the book we know is Exodus, from what we number chapter 1, reading verses 8 through 22. Hear these words from the common English Bible translation. Now a new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He said to his people, The Israelite people are now larger in number and stronger than we are. Come on, let's be smart and deal with them. Otherwise, they will only grow in number, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and then escape from the land. As a result, the Egyptians put four men of forced work gangs over the Israelites to harass them with hard work. They had to build storage cities named Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they grew and spread. So much so that the Egyptians started to look at the Israelites with disgust and dread. So the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. They made their lives miserable with hard labor, making mortar, and bricks doing field work and by forcing them to do all kinds of other cruel work. The king of Egypt spoke to two Hebrew midwives named Pua and Shipra. When you're helping the Hebrew women give birth and you see the baby being born, if it's a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, you can let her live. Now the two midwives respected God, so they didn't obey the Egyptian king's orders. Instead, they let the baby boys live. So the king of Egypt called the two midwives and said to them, why are you doing this? Why are you letting the baby boys live? The two midwives said to Pharaoh, because Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women. They're much stronger and give birth before any midwives can get to them. So God treated the midwives well, and the people kept on multiplying and becoming very strong. And because the midwives respected God, God gave them households of their own. Then Pharaoh gave an order to all his people, throw every baby boy born to the Hebrews into the Nile River but you can let all the girls live. Thus far, the story of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me as I share with you on the idea, let all the girls live. Oh Lord, let these words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of each and every one who hears my voice be acceptable in thy sight, for you alone are our rock and redeemer. Amen. How do you not know Joseph? The story of his rise to power in Egypt would have been told by the Israelites among like African Americans talking about Barack Obama's presidency. It's been almost 170 years and we still talk about Harriet Tubman. And I suspect in another 300 years, they too will remember Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. And yet, it seems a comprehensive grasp of history was never required for some to ascend to fame, fortune, and influence. 
Pharaoh may have been ignorant of his history, of how his four parents survived famine, but he knew just enough history to distrust the foreigner. Possibly he was aware of the inscription recorded for all to see by Queen Hepzibah, a vivid recounting of the ruin brought by the visitors from the Levet. The high coast had come from Canaan. It had taken nearly two centuries for the Egyptians to finally rid them from the land. The high coast were credited as being the cruelest of people. You know, how one thinks of the invaders who didn't just move into the house next door but claimed all of the properties and rights to those properties until you and your previous neighbors could only reside in designated cells allotted for foreigners. Whether or not these reports were true, the Egyptians had told their children and their children's children these stories until national perception became reality. It doesn't matter that black men are routinely killed by law enforcement. The perception is that an unarmed black man is more dangerous than a unit of armed officers. And national perception is reality. It doesn't matter that the offenders in the shootings in San Bernardino, the Oklahoma bomber, and the murderer in College Park, Maryland, were homegrown Americans. The perception is that job-seeking migrant workers crossing the Mexican border present a violent threat to those who believe themselves to be white. And national perception is reality. So it doesn't take much historical imagination to see how Ramsey's egotistic dedication to proving to all that he was the greatest and the most powerful of all Egyptian pharaohs might enable him to put together these efforts into an extensive program that would conscript an ethnically delineated working class to work on his construction projects. Some form of slavery has been around throughout recorded history. One estimate claims that forced labor in the private economy generates $150 billion of illegal profits every year. 20.9 million people are in modern slavery around the world. 5.5 million are children. 11.7 million people are in slavery in the Asian Pacific region. 3.7 million people are, are in slavery in Africa. 1.6 million are in slavery in Latin America. And 1.5 million are in slavery in developed country, countries. Now, I don't know what comes to your mind when you read enslaved persons, but if you're finally imagining that the transient descendants of Abraham are black, remember, slavery is not an inherently black condition. Enslavement does not describe the fate of all persons of African descendancy. The description of those enslaved in ancient Egypt were not included in scripture as some nod to a diverse community. Rather, it is a chapter in the story of God's intervention into human history, an intervention that propelled Harriet Tubman to sacrifice her life to liberate her people. Maybe if Christians and Jews would tell this story as God's story, it would propel a young working woman in an Indian brick kiln to seek freedom. Maybe if Christians and Jews tell this story as God's story, it would convince a migrant worker that the economic exploitation of modern civilization is not the way the Creator God intends for this kingdom to function. Maybe if Christians and Jews tell this story as God's story, it cannot 
be used to console the sons and daughters of the Confederacy that their slave-holding grandparents were upstanding Christians, nor could it be used to convince the sons and daughters of enslaved African Americans that the God who raised Jesus from the dead is the deity only for those who believe themselves to be white. But that would mean telling the story as if we believe not only that there is a God, but that we trust God is good, even when adversity strikes. The interesting thing about adversity is it has a capacity to strengthen the persecuted. That is, when those persecuted look beyond their circumstances to glimpse their created purpose. And for ancient Israel, the glimpse was the continued growth in their population. The more they were oppressed, the more they grew and spread. Fertility was for the Israelites a mark of their obedience to the creational mandate, be fruitful and multiply. That mandate to Adam and Eve was given to Noah, confirmed with the covenant made to Abraham and Sarah and again with Isaac. When the sons of Jacob arrived in Goshen in the land of Egypt, they followed their forefathers' lead, for they were fruitful and multiplied exceedingly. God's intention in creation has been realized in this family. One scholar described this as a microcosmic fulfillment of God's macrocosmic design. Let's be clear, slavery is slavery. But let's also be clear, the Egyptians didn't disrupt the family unit. The Israelites weren't forbidden marriage as if they were chattel rather than men and women. Ancient slavery exposes the evil of modern slavery because as oppressive as the labor practices described in scripture were, it didn't categorically assume the inhumanity of the enslaved persons. So the ancient Israelites, while enslaved in Egypt, still practiced their customs. They still gathered as a family to share meals, separating into households so that the families of Egypt and the families of Israel could be distinguished from one another on that Passover night. And it may well have been the divine preservation of the family union that made possible Israel's deliverance. Heads of families represented the family's interest to the clan, and the clan leaders represented their constituency's interest to the tribe. And each tribe could represent their own interest in respect to one another. So the Israelite head of household's obedience to God spared their family the death and destruction afforded Egyptians whose heads of households rejected that strange prohibition. To lead Israel as a whole group, apart from this kind of unofficial representational self-governance system in place, would have been an impossible task of mobilizing. We, we might picture Moses as herding cats, but he wasn't trying, but he wasn't. He, he was trying to herd sheep and cattle and cats. We sometimes forget that the masses moved by Moses were not just the adult laborers, he shepherded families from Egypt. If you could think of a preschool field trip, a family vacation, a college spring break, and a fire drill in a retirement community as a single event, you're beginning to get the idea. There were lots of them. Fertility was the mark of God's blessings upon Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even in their estranged existence. And the writer of Exodus has set us up here. That is, the writer has set up Pharaoh. 
If you remember the promise to Abraham, we could have anticipated that Pharaoh's resistance to this particular population made him a marked man. Did you catch that? Israel's population growth is a direct result of Yahweh's blessings. Any attempt to confine or restrict the children of Israel is in fact cursing the people of God. The divine promise made to Abraham was that God will bless those who bless them. And the one who curses him, well, God isn't swooping in as an intervener here. This is evidence of God's faithful presence and ongoing work of creation and blessing. God is just doing what God does. And since God's faithfulness is sure, Pharaoh is on a path to certain devastation. But before that road turned into a full-on mudslide, shall we say it was got, a, got a little bumpy. It all started when he enlisted a couple of women to aid in a scandalous plot. I'm not making this up. The biblical narrative is filled with scenes that bring powerful men before equally powerful women. So Pharaoh stands before a couple of OBGYN assistants offering them a refresher course in childbirth. And in a reversal of the Hippocratic Oath, he suggests, when you're helping the Hebrew women give birth and you see the baby born to be a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, you can let her live. Selective late-term gender abortion is not a modern procedure. And the idea of killing the boys of an entire community was not original to King Herod. The practice of systematically destabilizing a, pop, a people group by executing their young males has been around for a long time. The dominant society has long sought to emasculate minority men, lynching, mass deportation, mass incarceration, widespread distribution of drugs, widespread distribution of guns, inadequate educational systems, favoring feminine qualities as if empowering one gender over and against another gender has ever been good for any society. Let the girls live has an ominous ring when it's suggested by minority, majority men with moneyed military might. Let the girls live is a dangerous provision when 98% of people trafficked for sexual exploitation are women and girls. Let the girls live is a threat to society when little boys believe their only options for survival in a racist society is is gangs or gender reassignment. Let the girls live offers little consolation when 300 kidnapped girls are forgotten, 10,000 girls routinely kidnapped and trafficked doesn't make the news, and burning a woman alive is considered appropriate punishment for an inadequate dowry. Let the little girls live make no sense if the system the girls per perpetuate makes them say, hashtag me too, for being visual sex objects, violated with, reputed, with repeated abuse, and victims of power brokering maneuvers that solidify gender inequality. Why are these deaths and deals so acceptable by the modern general public? Possibly. It's because in the minds of the majority of, of the population, the system they put in place is working. That is a lethal us versus them system to rid society of undesirables. Existing laws and practices favor self-preservation in a country where more and more citizens own and carry firearms. In this system, middle-class Americans tend to give police the benefit of the doubt when guns are fired. American citizens, however, are subjected to the opposite bias, guilty until proven innocent. If someone is shot, chances are they were up to no good. 
Gated communities and convenience store parking lots should not provide sanctuary for blameworthy offenders. So as the number of black deaths continues, Americans identified as black and brown and their allies are questioning the system that sustains this course of action. But they are not the only disenfranchised citizens. A United Methodist pastor here in the Twin Cities posted a good question on Facebook last year. What are the conditions, what is the environment that produces such behavior? Access to weapons, lack of access to jobs, housing, quality education, healthy food, or mentors? What qualities reinforce such behavior? Self-hate, unrealized, unexpressed trauma, identity disconnection, fear, hopelessness? What meaningful solutions are we seeing nationally among other communities under siege? Robust job programs for our young adults and group homes and housing initiatives that include life skills and community programs, rites of passage programs with local respected institutions, community church presence in neighborhoods of need a focus on education and improvement of test scores for middle school kids. This pastor reminded us that it's easy to see the headlines and simply post hashtag pray. But what he suggests is that we need to look at this list and see what other ideas we can add to see what we should alter and then commit to making them happen. Because some laws, some practices, need to be ignored by the people of God whose lives demonstrate the divine intervention in the world. That's what we learn from Shippa and Pua. They were not impressed by being invited by the king to do the king's bidding. They were not enchanted by a powerful man singling them out by name. They were not hypnotized by being given a role in the new administration. And they were not infatuated by their new power over the survival of others. They chose to fear God rather than fearing men. No matter how arrogant he was, no matter how many towers he built, no matter how many cities bore his name, no matter how powerful he sought to be, they chose to fear God rather than fearing a man. To decide to obey God is always a choice and they chose to respect God. Respect of God meant the most powerful man in the world could not enact a law that they would follow if it meant being at odds with God. Respect of God meant taking a life was never an option. You can call it abortion or capital punishment. You can call it mass incarceration or a system of welfare. You can call it school choice or a failed public education. You can call it political assassination or an assassination of character. You can call it alternative facts or slanted reports of history. Respect of God means taking a life is never an option. And just because the government writes a law doesn't mean you have to follow it. That's what we learned from Shipra and Pua. Midwives matter. And here again is where midwives matter. Something else that we learned from the, these two is that every act of civil obedience in the name of God does not require a theological debate. When asked why the Hebrew baby boys were thriving in their delivery room, they didn't quote Genesis 9-1. Go ahead, pull up your phones. I know you don't know what it means. Go ahead, I'm not going to tell you. They didn't call for a strike of midwives protesting Pharaoh's Planned Parenthood program. They didn't even call for a fast of faithful followers of the fertility clause. They went to work. They did their job the way they were trained to do it, saving lives without compromise. New legislation didn't negate divine directives. A new administration would not be allowed to undermine their practice of justice. Congressional confusion did not reverse their commitment to mercy. Midwives matter. 
And when you ask who is sufficient for this task, Shipra and Pua show us that we can let our little light shine right in the corner where we are. For if we dare to proclaim the word of the Lord to tax collectors and sinners, fishermen and Pharisees, scribes and disciples, women and lepers, the risk is to be criticized for your hospitality, condemned for acting as if captives have been set free, and disapproval because you believe God can convert a Muslim to Christianity without creating a socialist. Know that if you do these things, you will receive no less than the one in whose name we claim to preach. When Jesus told parables to convey how heaven rejoices when just one sinner repents, the recorded episode says among the crowds were angered religious leaders. They feared the collapse of the apartheid that they had established. They knew that if women could speak and that slaves were free, their control would be abolished and their status quo upset. So there stood Jesus talking to power brokers and working class, telling stories to men in power about women cleaning the house to recover one coin, talking to tax collectors and fishermen about shepherds and sheep. You see, the saying is worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Midwives matter because they gave birth to the next generation who speak of a God who turns nobodies into somebodies, who can tell the world about somebody who will save everybody. And that means understanding that we too must take the role of fighting against the laws that fight against God's justice. That we must accept our task not to follow what politics and power and fame and fortune offer us, but to trust that what God is giving us is enough because God is faithful and God is trustworthy. And God cares about the lives of little boys even when we let the little girls live. Amen. Above 
Jo 